you heard about uh, CAPM and mean variance, uh, which basically you know tells you that there is some trade-off uh, between risk and return. Uh, and then mean variance analysis uh, teaches you that there is something called diversification. And so basically for most people, you know, it's a bad idea to put all the money into one stock. This is the main result uh, from diversification. Um, but the problem with these theories is that uh, they are not really good approximations of reality. So for example, uh, here, if you look uh, at the historical return on S&P 500, uh, this is the blue curve uh, since 2000, and you look at the best possible normal uh, calibration, then the thing that you see immediately is um, that it's um, scenarios where you lose uh, 40 and 20% uh, have happened much more frequently than this nice uh, bell-shaped uh, curve uh, will predict. And there's also the fundamental question of what is investment risk? Because when you do mean variance, uh, you are assuming that deviation from the mean, whether they are positive or negative, are equally undesirable. Um, but I'm quite sure when, when you make your own investments, um, then you are not worried about earning too much money. You probably also are not worried about having a portfolio that trends upwards with some fluctuations around uh, this positive trend. But if you lose, let's say, 20% uh, of 40%, uh, then this is probably something that will hurt uh, and might keep you up at night. Um, so most people, when they think about risk, it's the probability of experiencing uh, large losses when you are in the left um, tail here. Um, a final point about uh, mean variance uh, is that you are not only making this mistake for, let's say, S&P 500, you're making it uh, probably for all the assets uh, in your portfolio. But if you are still not convinced uh, that mean variance is a bad idea, then also think about the fact that it only allows you to have uh, linear uh, dependencies between your assets. And not only are they linear, they are also constant, no matter if you are in a scenario where S&P 500 increases by 10% or in a risk of scenario where S&P 500 falls by 40%. And I would say that most investment managers that I talk to, they believe that if you are in a significant uh, risk of scenario, then people will be buying bonds and central banks will find a reason to cut rates. Uh, so you will get an additional diversification from government bonds, for example. But mean variance uh, is not able uh, to, uh, to handle that. So then the question is, uh, what are the most uh, sophisticated investors uh, then starting to do? Um, First of all, uh, they use uh, fully general Monte Carlo distributions. So you can imagine here that you have a matrix R uh, where in each column uh, you have the individual assets. So this could be Facebook, Apple, Google, uh, if it's a stock portfolio. And then along the rows, uh, you have joint scenarios uh, for these assets. Um, associated with each of these joint scenarios uh, is a scenario probability. Um, that we collect into one uh, prior probability vector that we call P. If you then want to implement subjective views uh, or do stress testing, then one way that you can do it is by changing these uh, probabilities to something else, uh, the posterior probability vector that we call Q. Um, and then the big question is, of course, you know, which method uh, is good uh, for making these adjustments? Um, and here you see uh, the basic case of a relative entropy minimization. So in investment application, this is commonly referred to entropy pooling. Um, and the nice thing about this approach, when you change probabilities from a prior to a posterior, is that you do not need to do any repricing. So let's say if you have a portfolio with S&P 500 and then lots of derivatives written on S&P 500, then you can perform stress testing on S&P 500 directly and then be sure that the PNL distributions, the posterior PNL distributions will be given to you uh, for the derivatives when you use uh, this approach. Um, so here you see, as I said, uh, the basic use case and there are many, many uh, sophisticated ways that you can use entropy pooling to do some really, really deep analysis. Unfortunately, uh, we don't have the time to go through these, um, but you will have references uh, at the end of the presentation uh, where you can dive in and, and read about it.
but you can think about entropy pooling as a generalization uh, of Bayesian updating in the sense that you go from the prior to the posterior uh, by changing, uh, yeah, by inputting views about the posterior. So usually in Bayesian updating, you have a prior, then you get some data, and then you get to the posterior. Uh, you don't need uh, this uh, with entropy pooling. So, so it's of course very, very flexible uh, for you to do uh, what you want. Okay, so the next slide here is just um, a comparison of uh, of the old methods and then this new framework. Uh, so instead of using uh, the normal distribution, which <laughs> we have discussed uh, has you know many many problems in relation to fitting real world markets, you have these uh, fully flexible Monte Carlo distributions with associated joint scenario probability vectors. Um, and then instead of using black Litterman to implement views on the means, and black Litterman relies on KBM normal distribution and a lot of duct tape engineering uh, to make things work, uh, you have this theoretically sound uh, entropy pooling approach, uh, which also allows you to easily implement views on variances, uh, skewness, kurtosis, and correlations, uh, so not uh, just, uh, just means. And then finally, instead of doing analysis uh, that relies on variance, uh, you can do analysis that uses CVAR. And um, CVAR is basically concerned with minimizing the probability of experiencing um, yeah, large losses. The good thing with CVAR is that it operates directly on these uh, Monte Carlo scenarios with associated probability vectors. So it doesn't matter how complex your distribution is, CVAR analysis will still uh, give you meaningful results. And um, <laughs> the funny thing is actually, if you are in a scenario where returns happen to be normal, then and implement CVAR as, as we recommend, then actually the results that you get from CVAR and the results that you get from variance um, are going to be the same. So, so you lose nothing in that case. But of course, in all other cases where you have distributions that are closer to real world markets, uh, CVAR will give you much more meaningful uh, results uh, than variance. So uh, here <laughs> you just see some visual uh, examples of some of the things that you can do uh, with this uh, new framework. Um, so on the left uh, side, uh, you see a view or stress test that we have implemented where you have stagflation and a rake hike. So this is basically the scenario where you have low growth, uh, high inflation, and then central banks still decide to increase interest rates. And this is the scenario that most uh, investors are afraid of. And so it's of course very, very important to know uh, how the different assets uh, behave uh, in, in this case. Um, yeah. The question is then, how do we implement this stagflation plus rate hike uh, scenario? And this is basically a combination of uh, Bayesian networks and entropy pooling. Um, so this is a framework that we call causal and predictive market views and stress testing. This is a quite sophisticated method. Then again, we, we do not have time to go into details with, but that you can read about in the reference where you can see everything about how this works. On the right hand side, uh, you have another example where we use entropy pooling directly, uh, but in a sequential way. Uh, so here you can imagine that you have a 60-40 portfolio um, and then you compute the 90% CVAR of that portfolio. So you implement the view that you are in the case where the expected return in your portfolio is the 90% CVAR. And not only that, your correlation goes from minus 20 to plus 20. So you are in the left tail of your a return distribution uh, and diversification fails. Uh, so this is uh, a tail risk scenario if, if there ever was one. The important point here is that when you use entropy pooling, it gives you a posterior distribution that very, very clearly shows you what are the joint scenarios that you need to hedge uh, to avoid experience uh, big losses in these adverse scenarios. So you can tailor your tail hedges in a very, very uh, yeah clever way. Um, to summarize, I hope that uh, these examples, they show you that you can do much, much more uh, with the new framework uh, that the old one uh, simply cannot do. Uh, and it, that it is basically our imagination that is uh, the biggest limiting factor in relation to how we use these things. Okay.
So, so far, uh, we have been talking about uh, the market representation and, and views and stress testing. But of course, we want to be able to optimize our portfolios uh, with the stress test and the views that we have implemented. And here again, uh, the good thing is that um, mean CVAR optimization will be able to handle uh, these complex um, yeah, Monte Carlo distributions and uh, stress tests. Um, our preferred way of doing portfolio optimization is to maximize the expected return um, with constraints on overall portfolio risk and uh, the yeah, tracking error risk of short-term deviations. And this is because most of the clients that we talk to, this is actually the binding constraints uh, that they have. When you look at this uh, portfolio optimization problem, uh, you will quite quickly see you know, some other real world features that you probably don't see in the textbook. Uh, so first of all, if you are a multi-asset investment manager and you can invest, let's say in futures, or you can put money into a, um, yeah, some active manager that you need to pay a fee, uh, then of course you need to subtract this as a holding cost. So this is quite simple. Then finally, uh, in the expected return, you also need to uh, subtract the transaction cost uh, that you have uh, right now from trading from your initial portfolio to something that you optimize for. Um, what you also see here is that transaction costs, they do not only subtract from your expected return right now, they also decrease the amount of money uh, that you can invest in the market. So basically uh, you have this self-financing constraint, which tells you that your, the value of your portfolio after optimizing plus the transaction cost must uh, sum to one. Uh, and this is of course, without uh, loss of generality. When you look at this problem formulation, then you might also note that we are optimizing over a vector that we call E. So we are not optimizing over uh, portfolio weights um, because uh, yeah, we are optimizing over portfolio exposures. And the reason that it's necessary to make this separation is because yeah, when you have derivatives in your portfolio, uh, you must um, yeah, you must make a separation between market values and exposures to be able to handle them in a elegant way. So the, here you can see this is the vector of relative market values. In the references, uh, you will have an article that clearly uh, um, explains uh, this framework, so you can dive in and uh, and see how it works. Um, a final comment is that if you want to solve this problem as it's formulated here, uh, it's quite easy to do for variance. So this is just second order cone programming, uh, no big deal. But it is uh, quite challenging to solve uh, for CVAR optimization in a fast and stable way. And then usually in practice, um, when you do portfolio optimization, you would also want to introduce uh, some uncertainty into the means uh, estimate that you have. So you would solve this problem many, many, many times. Uh, and this is where you really, really need uh, yeah, the speed and stability. And I think that this is one of the reasons that people do not uh, use uh, CVAR so much right now, because it's really, really hard to solve compared to, to variance. All right. So here um, is the list of references that I was talking about. First of all, there is this article that goes through uh, a comparison between variance and SIVA optimization. It introduces the optimization with risk budgets. And uh, then uh, you have an article that gives a recap of entropy pooling and introduces uh, the sequential way of using it as we did in one of the examples. Um, after that, you have this portfolio management framework for derivatives, where you learn about this relative market value, why you need to separate into exposures and not just portfolio weights. And um, finally, you have this caution predictive uh, framework where you combine Bayesian networks with entropy pooling. Um, for all of these articles, uh, there is a company code. Uh, that we provide you as open source uh, using our open source package. So you can go in, you can see the examples, you can play around with it and test that you understand uh, the theory and, and maybe explore it uh, even more. Uh, finally, I will encourage you to uh, yeah, connect with me on LinkedIn uh, where I post regularly about this framework and other quantitative investment management related stuff. Uh, in this group, which is called the Applied Quantitative Investment Management, this is where I, I post all my content. So I encourage you to, to join that uh, at the very least. And now I'm just uh, looking forward to your questions.